Trigger warning, this podcast contains discussions of sensitive and potentially distressing topics, including but not limited to sexual assault, SA neglect, strong language, loss of loved ones, suicide, and domestic abuse. Listener discretion is advised. If you're easily triggered or sensitive to these topics, please take care of yourself and consider whether listening to this content is appropriate for you at this time. If you or someone you know is in crisis or needs support, please reach out to the following hotlines. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for the U.S. is 1-800-273-TALK. That's one 800 273 8255. Their crisis text line for the U.S. is text hello to 741-741. Again, that's text hello to 741-741. The National Domestic Violence Hotline for the U.S. is 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. If you are outside the USA, please seek out your local resources and hotlines for support. Your mental health and safety are important and help is available. You're not alone. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, Team Nani Cut here. Thank you again for joining me, Made in the South. Last week we kind of left off at the cliffhanger. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Honestly, I've kind of put putting putting together this episode specifically because it is a hard topic for me to talk about personally. This is one of the more darker times of my life, especially as an adolescent, you know, like 12, 13 and Going into adulthood, this most likely will be a, maybe a four-parter, just because there is so much to cover and so many terrible things happened to me during this part of my life, my journey. Uh, welcome to Made in the South, Episode 3, Big Bad Wolf. Again, I do the trigger warning at the beginning of each and every podcast. Uh, this episode specifically will be dealing with sexual assault of a minor myself at the time um so if you're not prepared for that mentally please protect yourself and feel free to turn me off um for everyone that still wants to join me and continue forward thank you for your support and kind words again little tina is healed this is a difficult topic and episode (laughs) for me to approach i I laugh but i'm not really laughing I got myself a new microphone for you guys, <laughs> so hopefully everyone can hear me. The audio is great. I'm a little bit just more, a little more casual and comfortable because if I'm going to be talking about icky stuff, why not have <laughs> my PJs on to do so? Hope everyone is good. Got your popcorn. Okay. So left off, you know, my mom, foster care, not the easiest of time, but not the worst of time. My dad had a stroke. Ended up taking care of him. Mom met this guy, William Whitehead. Every everyone called him Billy. My mom had always been codependent. She had always had someone else take care of her. So when this tall Native American, he's a Blackfoot Indian, rolled in and charmed the panties off of her, quite literally, she thought she met the one. What he saw was a vulnerable woman, a vulnerable single mother, because technically my dad being paralyzed in a bed, you know what I mean, poop in his pants, sorry, (laughs) you know what I mean, wasn't really a partner, she was forced into this role where she now had to take care of a grown man, like an infant, I'm sorry to anyone that has to take care of people that way, I'm wording it this way on purpose, I loved my father, I took care of my father. I treated him with grace and kindness and dignity. I want you guys to to be aware of that, but just for the purpose of my storytelling, to kind of put it in her, Billy's perspective. He's got this woman that's overwhelmed, doesn't know what she's doing, uneducated, too small, two young, attractive female daughters. Let that set in for a second. So he had just gotten out of the penitentiary. I mean, that would should be the red flag number one, right? He doesn't have a job. He's now, what, 57, hit almost 60. And he just got out of prison for serving 20 years. Now, the story that he told everybody about how he was in prison never made anything sense to me. But he was a big storyteller because 
Not anything that ever came out of his mouth was the truth. We'll get there. I don't want to aggress too much, but the story he told everybody, hey, I've been in prison for the last 20 years because I cut some man's head off. Exactly. Right? How do you just randomly cut some man's head off over some argument? I don't even remember like how he said the argument started, but he took out his hot bill knife and he cut the man's head off and they put him in prison for 20 years. And it, do you, if that is not, you know, outrageous and out there in your face enough, I swear I could not make this up, but this is not my made up story. This is William Whitehead's made up story. So he said that he was supposed to be on life. He was on, he was supposed to be there for life, but actually no, he was supposed to be as, sorry, backtrack. His story was that he was supposed to be executed, but the state of North Carolina executed the wrong William Whitehead. Now, how do you have two William Whiteheads in one state penitentiary on death row and you execute the wrong one? Now, why my mom ever believed this story? I have no, well, I mean, she didn't have much education. You know, she was desperate for affection and everything else and help, right? <sighs> so he said that his story was they, they killed the wrong person. His family had a whole funeral for him and everything. <laughs> and once state realized their mistake, oopsie, they released him because technically, legally, he was dead. <laughs> Again, not my story. Never believed it. I was always like, why are all these adults that he's telling the story going along with it? I just guess he had some kind of charisma. At first, he was sober, so when my mom met him, he wasn't drinking quite yet. So yeah, he did seem kind of cool because he's like hey you need help let me help you to my mother so my mom's like oh my god you can pick up kermit because kermit was 350 pounds my dad you know so at first billy was so helpful he would give my mom hugs and tell her you know how much he cared about her and you know she shouldn't have to do things on her own and I, well, he was, you know, knows how it feels to not have any help and be looked over because he'd been in prison, you know, for so many years. And that, you know, the world's being so hard to him, he really wanted to get a job and make better of himself. And before you know it, that foot was in the door. Before you knew it, I wouldn't say not even a month had passed when they started seeing each other. He was moved fully into our home. Fully into our home. So many red flags. As an adult now, I look back, especially as a mother. Imagine the dating scene, you know, as a single parent. Why would I ever want to, no offense to people that have been reformed in, in the system, but why would I ever want to not research why my partner was in the prison system? Why would I not want to vet that out myself? Why would I, I mean, let's just say I'm open-minded, okay? People's past or their past, you know, they, they are welcome to rehabilitation, you know, and a new life and stuff like that. But I'm sorry, I would have follow-up questions. I would want to know more. There was never any of that. My mother never had any follow-up questions. She just went blindly with it. And now I've got 13-year-old me and 12-year-old Sheila, my sister, of course, we both ended up developing quite young. What I believe the truth of Billy Whitehead's wild adventure of story of why he was in prison and why how he got released because of a state mix-up is because he was a pedophile. I believe that he touched someone else's child and he was locked up for 20 years. This is my feeling on this 110% because a predator doesn't change. At least not him. There was no reforming that person. He was just waiting for his next victim. And he found one. Gullible, not educated, Pearl Honeycutt. Two vulnerable little girls. We were kids that never had love. Right? Too young, prime, Innocent girls. <sighs> My sister was very outspoken. She never liked him, ever. 
They fought a lot, like cats and dogs, like verbally, physically. They never got along. Me, I was too worried still. I was in this mindset of must obey. If I don't obey, then me and Sheila will be on the streets and there'll be nothing to eat. It is my job to obey, to take care of each other so we have a space. I just need to make it till I'm 18. Even then, I was like, the mindset, just need to make it just a little bit longer. But for now, head down, take care of Kermit, go to school, don't cause any issues. Try to be the most perfect daughter ever. Don't give Pearl any reason to be ever angry at me. So... <laughs> Meanwhile, my sister's like, F you guys, I'm running away. I don't like this guy. I'm going away. My sister was so fearless in some ways. In some ways, I envied her so much that she could just be so carefree and just run off. But then my sister got into drugs, and then she started having sex early because she thought sex was a way to to get gained love, you know, and she was trying to fill that void in her. She's like, oh, if a man has is physical with me, he'll love me. He means he wants to be with me, and I'm special. And I really wish that that had been the case, but she was a 13-year-old child. 13-year-old child that had to grow up way too soon because her mother's boyfriend was forcing himself on her. My sister didn't go quietly into the night. She fought him. Tooth and nail. Unfortunately, I didn't know. I guess, sorry, I don't want to get flagged for this. That she was being R-word. Essayed by him. I thought that he hated her because of the way they would interact with each other in front of everyone else. Because he would always call her names and she would say F you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they, would, they would butt heads. So I never thought that he was doing that to her I thought all of his attention was focused on me poor little Tina <laughs> and again here I am obey don't speak out you need a place to stay there's food so when he starts putting his attention on me telling me how beautiful I was and how much he loved me and I should come over here come sit on this lap Come let me hold him. Let him hold me. And I was being a good girl. For many years, I hated myself. Even after. I felt so disgusting. So gross. He would make me say I loved him. He would treat me like we were in a relationship. He would always say... One day I'm going to take you away from here from your mom and we're going to be together. And the whole time I'm thinking, don't fucking touch me. Get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. Inside I'm screaming. Inside I'm dying. I started disassociating at a young age. It was the way that I could survive what he was doing to me. He would come to me in the middle of the night. You know, the typical story. Where's my mom? Why isn't she noticing any of this? Where is she at protecting these two young girls? Nowhere. So I got really good at checking out. He'd come into the room. He'd touch me, and I'd leave. My physical form would be there, but I'm somewhere else. And after he was over, unfortunately, he would do something, and I would come back, and he would look at me, and he would say, I love you. Don't you love me, too? That was good for you, too, wasn't it? Don't worry, I used a condom so you won't get pregnant. took a lot of years for me to be able to be in a romantic relationship with someone and be able to say, I love you. You can imagine how that being forced to say those things. It was a long time before I could even stand someone touching me. 
I still have triggers. I kind of always have to be in control if I wish to be intimate with someone. If I'm not the initiator, some, I not to say that I've le I've learned now to let someone else be an initiator, um, but it took a lot of work, me self work, working well on myself because I didn't want to let what was done to me win. I deserve to have to write my own history, to be in power of my own body, my own pleasure, as it were, eventually. At some point, this is association, while it was a defense mechanism and it helped me survive and helped me mentally push through, but it also shut my emotions off. It made me withdraw. People didn't notice me. I started getting smaller and smaller and quieter and quieter. And I would go to school. I still was trying to go to school too, you know, and uh, take care of Kermit. I wasn't sleeping much, you know. And then when I did sleep, I was worried he'd come. During the day, he would express more attention to me. He would buy me little gifts and stuff in front of my mom. And then yell and scream at my sister. So then I was being put into this position of. You could understand the dynamic that was causing in the, in the family. And I never wanted his attention. I never wanted any. Every time he gifted me something, I threw it away when he wasn't looking as soon as I could. Because I didn't want anything that person was giving me. Nothing. Every fiber of my being wanted nothing from him. But someone gives you a gift my mom's looking he's expecting me to say thank you so i have to smile thank you my mom at one point i she had to be jealous of me because the way he was treating me he was very obvious about it it wasn't overt at all Co <laughs> it wasn't covert you know he's very overt about his advances he wouldn't like kiss on me or anything like that when we were in front of the other people. Um, but he didn't treat me like a stepdaughter either. I remember my mom one time got so angry with me because she used to go get her hair done every week. And she said it's t it was time for me to get a trim and I had my hair. My hair was about like the middle of my back and I used to have really long, thick, curly hair. Beautiful hair. The one of the few things I was vain about. I wasn't a vain person. And she took me to get my hair cut. And she cut all the way down to this. And part of me was like, so like, oh my God, there goes my beautiful hair. But then another part of me was like, he's not gonna wanna touch me if I look like a boy. So I let them, I let them cut my hair. Cause I was like, okay, well, he's not gonna be attracted to me cause he likes women. Secretly, I was like hoping that that would help, but it didn't. It didn't. It didn't. I've heard some things over the years that he liked both. That he's... So, I mean, he's a pedophile. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, I'm getting older. Every year it goes by, I'm developing more. Then I start my cycle. I would try to fight. I would try to delay him sometimes from touching me coming in my room, I would tell him how I'm having the worst period ever. And sometimes that would work. I would try to avoid him as much as possible. I never wanted to be near him. But this time he's drinking every day, all day. He's not looking for work. He hasn't been looking for work. He's not helping my mom. He's just another expense and dead weight at this point. Then he convinces her, you know, I don't want to go to work. I want to be a business owner. <laughs> And it, I like to drink, so why not open up our own speakeasy in our house? I swear to you, if everything I'm saying in this podcast is the truth, my story is so outrageous that if you don't, if I hadn't have lived it myself, I would not believe the things that I am saying. So I understand if people are taking my story with a grain of salt and be like, oh my goodness, she's the best bullshitter in the world, but I'm not. I'm actually a very bad liar. So he convinces my mother that he can run a speakeasy out of our house. So we sell <laughs> dollar shots of vodka and dollar shots of whiskey 
and a $1.50 Budweiser and a $1.50 Cooler's Light. Guess who he puts to work? Pouring drinks. Well, why not? You've got this cute little girl in the summertime, you know, pouring drinks. And then they would play cards all day. I'm really good at Texas Hold'em. Don't play cards with me. You'll lose. So, here I am, 14, 15. We've got all these drunk men coming in and out of my house all day long at all hours. I mean, we had people that were police officers that would come and party. There's no one I can go to. All these drunk men. And do you think that they kept their hands to themselves? Do you think they tried to keep their hands to themselves? No, they did not. I end up always carrying a knife on me. And I got really frisky about telling them to keep their hands off of me. When people would grab me and pull me in their lap or grope me, no one helped me. Billy would sometimes get mad because I was his piece of meat. But did he stop his customers <laughs> from doing that to me? No. Again, I'm still trying to navigate, taking care of Kermit, go to school. Me and my, my sister's in and out. She's running in and out. She keeps running away. And the only time I, we could find her is when she was ready to come home, you know, and then she'd let the police find her and they'd bring her home. And it, she'd be there for a day or two and then she was off again. She never wanted to stay home and I don't blame her. I didn't know anything else. So the hell you know, they say sometimes is better than the hell you don't know. Oh, wow, I'm already at 20 minutes, and I'm not even halfway into this <laughs> debacle. <sighs> Where was I? Oh, yeah. Much, you, I had no chance to have any normalcy in my life. Not even a little bit. I wasn't allowed to have boyfriends, because God knows, Billy was. I had no freedom. No freedom of self, no freedom of expression, no privacy. I ended up putting and installing one of those sliding locks on my bedroom door at night to try to keep him out and also the customers out. I never got essayed by any of the customers because I would pull the knife on them and tell them not to do that. I wish I had been brave enough to do that to him, but unfortunately, that conditioning and fear was really strong in me. He was much, much stronger than me. He could hurt me so easily. And then he would say things like, well, what if I leave? How would, what would your mom do? So now I have this added layer of guilt. You can't tell anybody. This is just between us. You're my secret sweetheart, but you know who I really want to be with. When you see me kissing your mother and stuff, just know that I'd rather be kissing you. Gag me with a spoon. This goes on for years. Years. I'm living this life, this balancing act, trying to juggle school, my dad, keeping these drunk men off of me, pouring drinks, cleaning house, trying to avoid him to tell him I'm on my period or I'm too busy, I'm too tired to whatever, but he's still forcing himself on me. I had no social life at school. People would try to talk to me and I would beat it. I worked clothes, oversized clothes because I didn't want anyone to see me because I was not, I was ashamed of having breasts. I was ashamed of having sexual features. I was ashamed of the things that Billy loved about me. I tried to everything I could to make myself not attractive, to not look like a girl, to not be feminine. I hid myself in the library. I was always reading with a book. When people would talk to me, I would pretend I didn't hear them. Teachers would try to like, I had maybe like one math teacher who tried to like reach out to me a little bit. But I shut him down because I didn't trust men. Of course I didn't trust men. Why would I trust men? But he really was just an honest, Mr. Frank was honest to God, a great teacher, and he really did care about me. 
kids would ask if they could hang out with me after school and I would think to myself, I can't bring them to my house because there's a bunch of drunks there, A, right? Billy would never allow that. Or they'd be like, Tina, can you come, why don't you come spend a night with me or come to my party? But again, control, he's not going to let me go anywhere. Because what if I see a cute boy and they flirt with me or whatever? I mean, I'm his prized slice of meat there. I was really short. I'm still short. So I looked really youthful. Even at like 16, I still looked like I was 12. I think that's one of the reasons why he was really fixated on me a lot because I looked very young, even though I was developed because he's a pedophile and kids are what he got off to. There's a lot of things that like, I don't like, I have a heart. It was really hard for me to breastfeed, for example, my children when I had children because that was one of the things that he always obsessed over was my chest. I remember one time my aunt was at our house, Elsie, and uh, she was walking past the, the living room or something and he didn't think anybody could see and he had sat down on the couch next to me and I have a little, we, I used to have two little dots and the name was Shivers and Buttons. And they were my dogs and I was holding shivers and he had sat down next to me and he put his hand down my shirt and was full on and I'm checking out. And I remember her walking by and he heard her finally and he's like, oh, I'm just petting the dog. I used to blame myself a lot. I did, but you know whose fault it was? The adults in the situation. There was nobody there that should have, that there's plenty of opportunities where an adult could have stepped in and made a better choice and protect me. As an adult, your job is to protect children. Children are our most valuable resources. Our most vulnerable population is our children. I think she told my mom. I think she did anything. She think she even said anything to him. She just said, ah, ha, ha, and walked by. <sighs> Told you this is a hard one. So if you have had a hard time listening to me talk about this, I, I apologize. I do. I apologize for the wrong doing that was done unto me. And yes, this is very triggering for me, but I have to do my safety nets and I've been working with my therapist because I told her I was doing this podcast and she said, Tina, how are you protecting yourself when you're talking about these moments? Because it puts me back in that state. I tell myself I'm safe. I'm almost 39. These people are dead. I'm not that child. No one can hurt me anymore. It wasn't my fault. That's what I have to tell myself. I have to ground myself in my reality in this moment right now. That is something that happened to me. But it is not who I am now. No one can hurt me again. I think that is a good way to kind of end off this section. It gets worse, unfortunately, but we'll save that for the next. I mean, this probably is going to be at least a four parter because I'm just getting this was just basically a foreshadowing of the big bad wolf. Mr. Billy Whitehead, William Whitehead. As a mother, I would never put a man above my children. I would never have my own desperation and loneliness put over the well-being needs of my children, my safety of my children. I 
I never grew up with a great role model for a mother. You can imagine how terrified I was when I found out that I was having a child for the first time. How could I be a good mother when I had never had a model for it? <sighs> All right. I think that's good enough. I know you see me smiling, but that's what I do. I push through, right? And this is a long time ago. These are shadows from my past. I pulled myself up <laughs> by my bootstraps and I've moved forward. But we'll get to how I did that. In the next episode thanks everyone so much for joining in again i know this was a heavy episode so go get some sunshine goose fraba i'm probably going to go for a nice walk in the sunshine now or eat some chocolate ice cream <laughs> whatever i have to do go hug my children that's probably what i'm going to go do thanks again for joining me if you like my content and want to hear more of my story